Welcome back. In any engineering design problem, it is extremely useful to derive a simplified model that describes the physics of the system. Such simplified models are a great support to the preliminary design phase and help to understand how the different design parameters influence the system performance. The same applies to space propulsion, for which the most commonly used simplified model is known as ideal rocket theory. In this video, and in the next one, we will take a closer look at the assumptions, equations, and implications of this model. What is the objective that we expect to achieve with the ideal rocket theory? You certainly remember from the previous video that we want to find equations for three important flow parameters. The jet velocity, the mass flow rate of propellant, and the exit pressure at which the propellant is expelled. We will derive these three equations by means of a model based on two main simplifications. The first one is related to the rocket geometry, while the second one is related to the physical assumptions we make to simplify the equations. In this course, I will show you only the building blocks of the ideal rocket theory and the final equations obtained by combining these building blocks without any explanation of the intermediate steps and mathematical derivations. Keep also in mind that the ideal rocket theory applies only to propulsion systems based on thermal expansion of the propellant and cannot be used in other cases, such as, for example, most of the electric propulsion concepts. Let's first take a look at the ideal geometry that will be used to derive the equations. In this figure, you can observe that we are considering only the final part of the propulsion system where the heating and the expansion process of the propellant takes place. In the combustion chamber, the propellant is normally at high pressure, high temperature and very low speed. Note that the words combustion and high temperature are in brackets because not in every propulsion concept a combustion takes place, or, more generally, the propellant is heated. The propellant is then accelerated in a convergent-divergent nozzle where no additional energy is usually provided, and what happens is simply a conversion of the propellant pressure and temperature into kinetic energy. We can highlight three particularly important nozzle sections for which, in our notations, we will use three different subscripts. The inlet section, denoted by C, where the propellant is assumed to be at the same conditions as the combustion chamber. The nozzle throat, denoted by an asterisk, which is the smallest section at the end of the convergent and the inlet of the divergent. And the nozzle exit, denoted by E. One very important geometrical parameter of the nozzle is the expansion ratio, defined as the ratio of the exit area to the throat area. Here is now a very long list with all the physical assumptions on which the ideal rocket theory is based. Let's go, very shortly, through all of them. The propellant flowing in the nozzle is considered not only a perfect gas, but also a calorically ideal gas, meaning that its specific heats are not dependent on temperature. Furthermore, the chemical composition of the gas in the nozzle is assumed to be constant. The flow in the nozzle is assumed to be steady, meaning that no dependence on time of any quantity is considered, and isentropic, meaning that no energy exchange between the fluid and the external environment take place. We consider a monodimensional and purely axial flow meaning that all quantities vary only along the actual direction and that the velocity is purely actual everywhere in the nozzle. Finally, we assume that no external forces, and in particular no friction, act on the propellant in the nozzle, and that the initial velocity of the propellant in the combustion chamber is negligible and thus can be taken equal to zero. Based on these assumptions, we can derive the building blocks used to find the ideal rocket theory equations. The first group of building blocks are the so-called conservation equations for mass, momentum, and energy. Conservation of mass means that no mass is generated or lost within the nozzle. 
Under the ideal rocket theory assumptions, this means that the mass flow rate shall remain constant everywhere in the nozzle. The mass flow rate, in turn, can be written as gas density times velocity times nozzle area. Conservation of momentum means that the flow pressure, density and velocity are continuously linked to each other by means of the equation you see in the table. The conservation of energy, finally, implies a relationship between the flow enthalpy and velocity. Another set of building blocks can be obtained from the equations for a perfect calorically ideal gas. You probably already know the equation of state of a perfect gas, which provides a relationship between its pressure, density, temperature and molecular mass. Since we have assumed isentropic flow, we can write an additional relationship that relates the flow pressure and density. In this relationship, a role is played by the quantity indicated here by gamma, which is the specific heat ratio of the gas, or the ratio of the constant pressure specific heat to the constant volume specific heat. Under our assumptions, we can also write the enthalpy as a function of the constant pressure specific heat and the temperature. The constant pressure specific heat is a property of the particular gas we are considering and can be calculated as a function of the specific heat ratio and the molecular mass. The Mach number is simply the ratio of the flow velocity to the speed of sound, which for an ideal gas can be easily calculated as a function of the other physical parameters. A Mach number higher than 1 means that the flow is supersonic, while for a Mach number lower than 1, the flow is subsonic. All the equations that we will see in the following are obtained starting from one or more of these building blocks, combined together in different ways, exactly like Lego blocks can be combined in different ways to obtain many different shapes. But first, there are still two assumptions we need to make in order to complete the picture. This is, once again, our ideal rocket geometry, and these are the flow conditions in the combustion chamber up to the nozzle inlet section. We have already seen that the chamber velocity, and thus Mach number, is assumed to be zero. But what about the other chamber conditions? For the moment, we assume to know the propellant pressure and temperature in the combustion chamber. We will see in the following a few more details on how these quantities can be estimated in different types of rockets. We assume to also know the other propellant properties, molecular mass, specific heat ratio, and constant pressure specific heat, which, as another consequence of our assumptions, are constant everywhere in the nozzle. Have you ever asked yourself why the nozzle of a rocket is convergent-divergent? Is there any special reason for this particular shape? This is a question we can easily answer with the help of the ideal rocket theory. By combining our building blocks, it is possible to derive this equation, which shows that the area variation to the nozzle, dA, is strictly related to the velocity variation, dV, through the Mach number. In the convergent part, where the nozzle area decreases and thus dA is negative, the flow can be accelerated with a positive dV only when it is subsonic, so the Mach number is lower than 1. In the divergent part, the nozzle area increases and dA is positive. Here, the flow can be accelerated only when it is supersonic. Thus, to make the propulsion system effective and accelerate the flow continuously and everywhere in the nozzle, we need a subsonic convergent and a supersonic divergent. This also means that the flow will be sonic at the nozzle throat which is a very important characteristic of all nozzles used in rocket propulsion systems. We are now ready to discuss the equations for the three flow parameters that, remember, were our initial objective for this video. We start with the jet velocity, which can be calculated by means of this equation. A high jet velocity, desirable for a better performance of the system, can be achieved in different ways. High chamber temperature is beneficial for the jet velocity, as well as low molecular mass. This is quite obvious, 
considering that lighter molecules are easier to be accelerated at twice speeds. A higher jet velocity is also obtained with a low ratio of the nozzle exit pressure to combustion chamber pressure, or, in other terms, when the flow is expanded more starting from the same chamber pressure. Let's now take a closer look at the mass flow rate. Here is the equation for this flow parameter, where a role is played by the van der Kerkhove function of the specific heat ratio. We know that a high mass flow rate is beneficial to achieve a high thrust level. This result can be obtained with a low combustion chamber temperature or a high molecular mass. Note that this is exactly opposite to what you need to achieve high jet velocity. High mass flow rate can also be obtained with high chamber pressure or with a high nozzle throat area. Remember that for an effective convergent divergent nozzle, the flow needs to be sonic at the throat. With a given throat area and given chamber conditions, sonic throat is made possible by only one specific value of the mass flow rate, the value given by this equation. The flow is therefore controlled by the nozzle, or in other terms, it is choked. For the exit pressure, unfortunately, the situation is slightly less straightforward. It is, it is possible to derive this equation, which relates to the specific heat ratio, the nozzle expansion ratio, to the exit pressure chamber pressure ratio. This equation is implicit and cannot be solved directly for the pressure ratio once the nozzle geometry is known. It needs to be solved numerically, or by trial and error, or graphically. Here is an example showing the relationship between expansion ratio and pressure ratio for three different values of the specific heat ratio gamma. Note that the dependence of the curve on the specific heat ratio is relatively weak. High expansion ratio means that the flow has more room to expand, and thus a lower exit pressure can be achieved for a given chamber pressure. Remember that lower exit pressure means higher jet velocity. When the chamber conditions and the nozzle geometry are fixed, the nozzle exit pressure is fixed. However, this nozzle can work under different conditions, depending on the altitude and thus the ambient pressure. Three different cases are possible. When the exit pressure is lower than the ambient pressure, we have an overexpanded nozzle since the flow has been expanded too much with respect to the external ambient conditions. When the exit pressure is exactly the same as the ambient pressure, the nozzle is adapted. Finally, when the exit pressure is higher than the ambient pressure, the nozzle is underexpanded. If the exit pressure is different to the ambient pressure, the flow adjusts to ambient conditions by means of a set of shock waves immediately after the nozzle. It is possible to show that, for a given nozzle geometry, the thrust is maximum at the particular altitude and ambient pressure conditions where the nozzle is adapted. We have now derived the equations for the three flow parameters that we needed, and thus achieved our objective. In the next video, we will see a few other important rocket performance parameters. Thank you for your attention.